Hi and welcome back to a new video. The other day I was browsing 9GIG, well actually that was months ago, and I came across some retro PC posts where they were talking about some legacy games such as Warcraft 3 or like Red Alert 2. And then I was thinking about I could actually spend some time playing some of these games again. But some of these games are also not capable of running on, let's say, Windows 10 or 11 anymore. That's why I thought about, well, I could just build a retro PC and game on it, right? And then when I was thinking about it, I also thought I could just rebuild one of the systems which basically got me into the entire thing. And that's what we're going to do today. The first contact I had building and tuning PCs was like in 2001, 2002, but I really had no clue what I was doing. I was following some PC magazines and some guidance from my brother, but I really had no clue what I was doing. And then it was getting around 2004 and they were talking about launching Battlefield 2. At that time I really enjoyed playing Battlefield 1942. It was one of the like my favorite games in my youth and I really enjoyed it and I absolutely wanted to play Battlefield 2. But my PC at that point was just way too bad. Then I decided to save up some money to buy a new PC. During 2004 I was doing some side jobs besides school like delivering newspapers and stuff, just basic things you can do as a kid to save up some money. But because you don't earn a lot of money and even back then in perspective, things were quite expensive. It took me over a year to save up all the money to buy the new PC. And until I had the money, it was also GeForce 7000 series, which came to the market because I was originally planning to get GeForce 6, like 6800 Ultra, which was amazing because you could hook up two cards into one system, SLI. SLI was pretty a new thing back then. And it was absolutely amazing to me. So my original plan was getting 6800 Ultra, but then the 7000 series was out and I bought two 7800 GTs. So yeah, I wanted to get the exact same components again as what I used back then. Managed to find almost everything. The only exception, for example, is the case. It's the same model, but back then I had the black version and this is like the gray silver version, which is not as nice, but should still be cool. Just by looking at the case, I'm already getting some pretty tough uh, flashback wipes. And also, if you just compare something like this, which is 17 years old, to the quality which we're seeing nowadays in cases, things have changed a lot. At least in the, let's say, premium segment. This is an Aerocool Aero Engine case, which back then was also not the cheapest case. It was also not the most expensive, but it was a more costly case. But compared to nowadays, you don't have all those like 5.25 inch base anymore, 3.5 inch base, fan controller, which is still left from the previous owner, I think. All these things you wouldn't find in a case nowadays anymore. And also, I think one of the reasons why I bought it back then is because of this fan in the front, the turbine fan. And this part turned out to be a huge bummer after like looking at this for a few seconds because I straight noticed it's not a real turbine fan. There is just a 120 millimeter fan sitting behind something that's looking like a turbine fan. It can spin just like utilizing the airflow, but it's like a fan behind something that's not a real fan. And after all this time, you will also straight notice what time will do to plastics. Just after opening this like two or three times, this piece of plastic is so brittle that it directly came loose from this front piece. I will just try to glue it back. But for now, let's continue with the mainboard and also assembly of the mainboard bundle with CPU and memory sticks. Back then, I decided to get the A8N SLI Deluxe mainboard. Because the A8N SLI Deluxe was the first board to bring SLI technology to AMD platforms. Previous to that, it was only possible with Intel-based mainboards, and this with Enforce 4 chipset was the first board to allow this. The A8N SLI Deluxe had some quite unusual features. Well, first of all, it was one of the first boards to also feature Dual Channel, because Dual Channel came to the market, I think, with Socket 939, at least for AMD. If I remember correctly, the previous platform, which should be Socket 754, did not feature Dual Channel and that came to the market with 939, at least for AMD. And because we were using the Enforce 4 chipset, as I said before, it would allow to run SLI. And that's what this card was made for. So we have this selector PCB in between those two PCI Express slots. So that's the main one, PCI Express X16. And if a single card was used, you would plug this selector card exactly the way it was like facing single card 
to this slot. And back then, because there were no like selector switches on the board itself, we would have to turn around this one, plug it in this way with dual video cards to the slot. And then it would tell the chipset that we're using dual PCI Express slots. And because we're going to use dual video cards, I plugged it in this way where dual video cards is facing the slot. Also quick side story regarding the chipset fan. Back then, I think Asus recalled the chipset fan because they seemed to fail for whatever reason. And I had exactly this case where after reading the story online, I found out that my chipset fan was also not spinning. And then I returned it back to Asus, at least, well, only the chipset fan, or I'm not even sure, maybe they, I just entered the serial number and they sent a replacement fan, but I remember that I had to replace this one. Might as well make sense at this point to remove this one and maybe change the thermal paste. Yep, it was a good idea to do that because it seems like the previous owner, yeah, didn't have a good relation to thermal paste. Let's say it like that. Time to clean this mess. Also quite nice detail. If you look on the side of the chipset fan, you can see some of those like fins of the heatsink are forming the SUS logo. Cleaned everything and you can see the nice and shiny Enforce 4 SLI chipset underneath. I also removed the plastic cover which is typically surrounding these chipsets and after replacing the thermal paste you would typically also be required to add one of those plastic shims to prevent any kind of short circuits between some of these SMD components and the cooler. But in this case, it's usually a lot easier to just add some like Captain tape or like insulation tape and then just add the thermal paste. Luckily, I still have this Corsair XMS DDR1 kit still laying around 400 megahertz, 512 megabyte per stick. And looking at the sticker on top right, you can read out the revision. It's XMS 3205V1.2, which points to the fact that these DIMMs are using Winbond memory ICs. And as I also pointed out earlier, we're using an AMD Athlon X2 4200 Plus. The AMD X2 4200 Plus dual core which I bought back then was like a trade-off of having a very fast CPU, not the quickest because the FX60 back then was very fast but also very expensive. It's basically the same CPU but the FX60 was clocking with 2.6 gigahertz, this one was clocking with 2.2 gigahertz but you could still manually overclock it. That was my intention back then. The CPU was manufactured in 90 nanometers and it had a transistor density of 1 million transistors roughly per square millimeter. And if you compare this with a recent AMD Sendai, an AMD Sendai recently has about 50 million transistors per square millimeter. So yeah, a nowadays AMD CPU has 50 times more transistors per square millimeter than this one. But Still, to me back then, it was an amazing CPU. I think I paid something like 300 or 400 euro back then for this CPU. The 4200 Plus had a TDP of 89 watt, but that's why we called Vanessa. Because back then there was this company called Titan and they made the cooler Vanessa. They had Vanessa in L-Type and S-Type. L-Type was the bigger version. I also want to add that this was not the original cooler I used back then because I couldn't find out anymore what kind of cooler I was using. I used the deep cool cooler, but I couldn't find the exact model anymore online. And you can also see because this is already listing LGA 1156 and 1366, this is a bit newer than the rest. It's about like one and a half years younger than the rest of the components, but I think it should still be quite cool to use this cooler. What I always found interesting, I never used it so far, but it is listing a 25 millimeter big heat pipe. I have some doubts that they actually had a 25 millimeter heat pipe back then. You have to give credits to Titan for the finish they put on this fan. If you look at this on any pictures or video materials, it will always look like this is some kind of metal, like maybe aluminum and then, I don't know, anodized or something, but this is just painted plastic, but it looks really good. I also think that this is a completely brand new unit, so it has never been used. You can even see that the protective film is still on there on top. I first initially thought that this like huge copper thing, which they called 25 millimeter heat pipe, is just like a like massive piece of copper. But considering the weight of this, it might actually be a 25 millimeter heat pipe. That is pretty strange. Not sure about this. But if we look at the fins of this cooler, the fins are so much thicker in material width. If you compare this with any, let's say, Noctora air cooler from these days, 
can see how thick the material is. That is quite interesting. The mounting mechanism is also very unusual. I'm not sure what to think about this, but we first have to add thermal paste because we would not be able to access this afterwards. It will be mounted using these screws on the outside and then the cooler will be mounted using these four screws, which means we first have to add thermal paste, which also means that plenty of the contact surface will be wasted. And yeah, that is in general quite strange. Okay, so thermal paste and the bracket are in place. And now fixing the cooler using this massive screwdriver which is included, that is a very strange mounting mechanism. Before we continue with the build, obviously it's absolutely recommended to test if everything is working, like the board, CPU, memory, because all these parts have been laying around for a very long time and I'm not quite sure if all of them will work out. That's also why I switched to a different VGA, that's a 9800 GT. That's also the first Asus ROG card they ever made. Switched on. VGA fan is spinning up to 100%, should slow down now, yeah, that's a good sign. And as you can see, we have the CPU, the 4200 plus correctly detected and also one gigabyte of memory is correctly detected, so that's great, which means that board, PCI Express slot and memory should be working out correctly and we can continue with the build.